All right. It is time for the word of the Lord. Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Surely you know that we can't live by bread uh, alone. Uh, and you felt that this week um, while we were fasting. Do me a favor. Just go to the book of Matthew. Once you're in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter number five. I'm sorry, Mark. Mark chapter five. Mark chapter five is where we're going to hang out. Let me just express kind of what I was just saying, which is how so godly proud I am of this church. I really am. Like, I, I really, this is not hyperbole. Um, I really love this church. And if I wasn't um, pastoring here, I would gladly submit and serve this local body because it is, it is a, a work that the Lord is doing. This past week, we fasted. Uh, all week long, we fasted from Monday to Friday, and we had every day we created avenues and opportunities for you guys to come together and pray. On Monday, we had a prayer call. Tuesday and Wednesday, um, we scattered throughout uh, different businesses and, and houses in Brooklyn, and that was Tuesday and Wednesday, and we just prayed. It was, prayers were so loud that people could hear them outside. On Thursday, the discipleship groups got together and, and prayed and um, and then Friday, we came in this room together. We worshiped Jesus, and we just spent the night praying. No gimmicks, no, no bells and whistles, just good old prayer. And we filled this room up with prayers. And, man, I'm just so proud of y'all. And just thank you to everybody that, um, that served, those of you who led those smaller groups around, um, around Brooklyn. Um, shout out to Yolanda for coordinating our discipleship stuff. Amen. Everybody that did the graphics, shout out to Daniel. If y'all have received any, any updates on the app, it's because Daniel was taking care of, uh, uh, of the app updates. And, and I'm just, I'm really, really, really grateful. And I've heard so many great reports, y'all, this week alone about how fasting um, really changed the trajectory of people's journey and how people have a renewed sense of personal relationship with the Lord and um, Job opportunities and promotions came this week. Financial provision came this week. I heard somebody tell me that they got so much clarity on decisions. I mean, God did some crazy stuff. Random people just, I mean, y'all heard the testimonies on, on Friday. Random people just walking up, people getting sick. It's just amazing what fasting is able to do. And my, my hope and prayer as your pastor is that um, we've created the pace for you to pick up and continue. Because fasting should be a continual self-discipline in your life. It, it shouldn't just happen when we corporately come together. Uh, but if you love Jesus and, and, and you submit to him, you should want to be close to him. And fasting does something. I don't know what it is. It's, I don't know if we figured it out yet, Yolanda, but it does something that just connects us back to the Lord. Um, how, how many found it uh, hard not to eat? Just, clear, just want to see the hands. How many people was like, the eating was easy? That's social media, though? I was like, I was like Pookie from New Jack City, fiending to get on that phone. I am gonna lie to y'all. Monday, I clicked the app and I was like, oh man, I clicked Instagram. I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm on a fast. It's just that natural. And so fasting helps us, you know, disconnect. I got text messages th this morning that um, some of y'all screen times was down 15, 20, 30, 40 percent. And I hope that we've created a new normal in our life of, of just really spending time and having devotion with the Lord. All right, I'm talking too much. Let's get to it. Let's do it. Mark chapter 5. Hey, listen, y'all, I, I have to catch a flight Im like immediately, like almost like I don't know if I'm going to make it immediately uh, after service. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to exchange pleasantries at another time. So I'm, I'm going to preach, and then if you guys will be gracious to me, I'm just going to slip right out and try to... Let's pray that this Uber driver know, know what they're doing. Y'all know my story, man. All right. We're in chapter 5. Pick me up in verse number 21. I don't want to rush this. This, I'm, this, is, this is good. Man, this story is so good. Verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. and He was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, J. Iris. Some of y'all might... Say Jairus, it, it's okay, it's, it's all right. But J. Iris by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him, meaning implored Jesus, earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Pay attention to this next verse. And he, meaning Jesus, went with him, meaning J. Iris, 
And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Somebody say 12 years. And who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not getting better, but rather grew worse. That is the worst. When you are spending, when you are exhausting all your energy on getting better and nothing works, but you get worse. Verse 27, she heard the reports of Jesus and came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned to the crowd and said, who touched my garment? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, yet you say who touched me? The Bible says, and he looked around to see who did it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, please, please, please pay attention to what he just called her. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside. Jesus got a little attitude right there. He put them all outside and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them not, uh, they, he strictly charged them not to, uh, that no one should know this and told them to give the girl something to eat. I want to preach today from the topic entitled Two Daughters Touched by Jesus. Two Daughters Touched by Jesus. If I could I didn't do this with the tech team, so it's not going to pop up on the screen if you're at home. But if I could put like a subtopic, it would be not just two daughters touched by Jesus, but two daughters interrupted, then touched by Jesus. Because I want to focus on the interruption today. Let's, let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Father, we, um, yeah, this, this isn't like this isn't a moment that we casually, <laughs> casually approach. We don't, yeah, that, that's not us, Lord. We don't, we don't just come to your word and just think we're going to understand it. We, we certainly don't come and just try to get some historical information. We do not come to just get af, a, a, an academic dump. But, but Lord, we come because we want to hear from you and we want the nutrients from your word and we want transformation and we want revival and we want a, a breakthrough. And so, Lord, all of those things can happen with one word. So, Lord, I pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would move up and uh, up and down every single aisle and every single seat. Those who are in the lobby, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move. Because we need to hear from you today. Thank you for this moment. We slow down and we say, yes, Lord, we are we are here listening. You speak It's in Christ's name. We pray. Somebody say amen. All right. Two daughters touched by Jesus. It, it really is a universal experience that I think all of humanity and certainly everybody in this room either has experienced or will experience. And that is the, uh, the in, uh, inevitability of illness or physical hardship. Sickness is just it, it, it's a part it's a part of life. I wish it wasn't, but it, it is regardless of 
your background, your upbringing, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of how long you've been walking with the Lord, you could have walked with the Lord for 1,500 years and still somewhere, somehow, some type of ailment will creep into your body. It doesn't matter if you do Pilates, if you, if you do yoga, it doesn't matter if you're all natural and you, you, know, you only go you know, to the expensive stores to get your food. Like it doesn't, none of that matters. We all will be touched by an infirmity at some point because our bodies are decaying. I just want to be very clear that sickness is a direct result of, of Genesis chapter 3. It's, it's a direct result. Like Genesis 1 and 2, there was no sickness. You didn't see Adam coughing. You didn't, you didn't see Eve sick. They were completely whole, completely healthy. But Genesis 3 happens and the Bible says that sin entered the world. And when sin enters the world, it fractures all of creation. And I don't think we realize that we are actually creation. And so therefore, inside of us, we have bodies that the scriptures tell us are decaying. Now, some of y'all know them bodies are decaying. Some of y'all know it. You, you know you're getting old when you hurt yourself sleeping. Like you ain't even, like you ain't jogging, you ain't playing basketball. You wake up like, I slept wrong. You, you're old. You're getting old. The body, the body is starting to decay. And I don't know anybody that has like real, like real sicknesses, like, like terminal illness or or, or um, a, a persistent cell, or a chronic illness. I, I don't know, but here's what I do know. No one signed up for diabetes. No one said, put me on a list for cancer. No, nobody said, give me heart disease. Give me kidney stones. Give me a stomach flu. None of us said that. And here's the thing about our sicknesses. Sicknesses aren't just, they don't just impact our physical health. But the severity of the sickness and even the longevity of the sickness can actually impact you emotionally. It, it can impact, impact you uh, uh, mentally as well. And so what I love in the text is that Jesus encounters not one, but two sick women. And in encountering two sick women, what is so important that you understand is that they share commonality with a few things. But one of the most uh, uh, prevalent commonalities that they have shared is they're both defined by their sickness. Please don't miss this. You don't get either one of their names. Oh, we know J. Iris' name. He, we get his name. We get his occupation. But when it comes to these two women, the only thing we know is they're defined by their sickness, their, their dysfunction, their, their, their infirmity. They're defined by their ailment. In both situations are severe. I want to be very clear. Now, one is, is, is presenting itself as more severe, but they're both severe. Now, here's the thing. The healing that takes place, we just read it, so y'all know what's going to happen in the story. But the healings that are going to take place are not on Jesus' calendar. Th these aren't scheduled. Like, Jesus didn't wake up and go, oh, there's two people I'm going to heal today. No, Jesus is minding his own business, getting out of the boat. And as soon as he gets out of a boat, he's presented with the first problem. What is the first problem? That there's a little girl that's sick. That is an interruption to his daily schedule. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I hate interruptions. Oh, I hate inconveniences. I, I hate things that are not planned. I really like things to be planned. I'm the type of person that I plan my day the night before. I know what I'm eating for breakfast. I know what I'm wearing. Like, I got it all laid out. I had ironed my stuff. Why? Because I like to be prepared. I'm not the type of, I'm on this new uh, no snooze. I don't know how y'all do, but I'm on this new uh, no, no snooze thing. It's because I was watching this podcast, and this podcast was talking about how when you was a Christian podcast, that when you hit the snooze button, what you're saying to the day is I'm not ready for you. And I'm like, oh, no, I want to be ready. God gave me another day. Oh, God, I want to be ready for you. I want to be ready for the day. And so I prepare the night before so that I can hit the ground running because I don't know who's going to come across my path that I get to share my faith with. I don't know who gets to watch my demonstration and love for representing Jesus. And that should be the disposition of all of us. And you know how we hate Mondays? You know what I'm talking about? Like try skipping a Monday. You'll then love Mondays. And so what would it look like for us to just go through life and just be open-handed? What Jesus does here is Jesus is on his way somewhere else and he gets, somebody say, interrupted. He gets in, he, there's an incon, a seemingly inconvenience that happens not once in the text, but twice. Now, I don't care how tight your schedule is, you will experience an interruption. 
Like, I don't care how serious you are about your calendar. The kids are going to need attention. The job is going, you know, you're going to be prepared to, to do one thing in the job and the boss is going to come down and give you something different and, or, or life just gives you something different. People will interrupt you. People will interrupt you. People will interrupt you. Sickness will throw things off. We all will experience interruptions. But the question is, what do we do? Have we ever stopped and prayed and said, God, is this interruption from you? Or am I too tight to the calendar? Now, listen, your boy is preaching, and I promise you, you can ask Chelsea. I, I'm sometimes legalistic with my calendar. Oh, don't put nothing else there. Like, just leave that right. Like, because in my mind, I'm more productive when I planned out. But what if real productivity is entering into your calendar moments for interruptions for gospel truth? Watch what Jesus does. Jesus don't got these two girls on his calendar. But Jesus gets interrupted, and as he's getting out the boat, there's a man by the name of J. Iris that comes up with a life inconvenience, seeming inconvenience for Jesus, but Jesus doesn't view it how I view it. Jesus doesn't view it as an inconvenience. He views it as an opportunity to do what? To flex his power, to show that he really is God so that people will see and know. Watch verse 21. Let's get acquainted with J. Iris for a second. It says, then, it says and, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then, here's the interruption number one. Then came one of the rulers from the synagogue, J. Iris by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is sick to the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Can we agree? This is actually a good, this is a good interruption. This is an emergency. Right? The little girl is sick, but wait, she's not just sick. She's sick to the point of death. That means she, she, there's no Theraflu that's going to help her. Like Alka-Seltzer plus NyQuil, not that DayQuil, something in that NyQuil. NyQuil ain't going to help her. She, there's no, so, okay, y'all natural. Natural home remedies and herbal teas ain't going to help her. She, she can't take two pills and call the doctor in the morning. She is beyond the point of physical help. She needs a miracle. She, she, needs, she needs an encounter. She needs a person that is able to do something with her sickness. Oh, thank God that J. Iris knows about a man that was born in Galilee that walks around and heals people. Thank, thank God he knows about him. Now, now we got to talk about J. Iris or we actually don't understand the actual text. J. Iris here, he's the only one that we're given his name. Again, you don't know. I mean, literally, the woman with the issue of blood is all we know. J. Iris' daughter, that's all. We don't know their names. J. Iris, we get his name. But we're so privileged today that we don't only get J. Iris' name, you get his occupation. The Bible says in verse number 22 that he's a ruler of the synagogue. That means he's a man of influence. That means he's a man of prestige. He's well-respected in the Jewish community. That means he's notable. He, he is important. We also know that he's wealthy because verse 35 says that, that one of the heads of the house comes in and, and tells him that the daughter's dead. Many commentators would say that is one of his servants, that he is, he's paying for other people to do a, a business on his behalf. And so the, he, he is a ruler of the synagogue. But please don't miss this. Rulers of the synagogue, scribes, and, 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 and Pharisees, y'all know they didn't fool with Jesus. Oh, they didn't like Jesus. They, they thought he was a lunatic. They... They thought he was a false prophet. They, they thought he had, there was moments where they were like he was possessed with a demon. So in other words, for the, for the ruler of the synagogue to go to Jesus, that means that he had to exhaust all of the avenues. Because I ain't going to Jesus first, right? I, I don't fool up with him. What, what, are, my, what are my peers and my colleagues going to say? Jesus has to be a last resort. And so I'm wondering if he goes through life and, and he's trying to figure out the daughter and he's trying to get her help. We know that the woman with the issue of blood exhausted everything trying to get help. And so she treated Jesus as a last resort as well. But I need you to understand what Jesus does is he makes everything fail so that he's the last one standing. Yeah, that's what, oh, you think I'm talking about the woman with the issue of the blood and J. Iris' daughter? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, I'm not talking about J. Iris. I'm actually talking about you now. 
Because what Jesus does not like to do is Jesus doesn't want to be one of your options. He wants to be your only option. That's what Jesus wants. And here's what my prayer was. Y'all going to get real mad with me on this one. But my prayer all week for you and for myself was that the things that we run to as first options, Jesus would destroy them. Oh, I, I, pray, I pray that that thing you run to, I pray that it would fail. I, I, I pray that the thing that you find most com comfort and, 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 and solace in, I pray that it would no longer be, I pray that you would be uneasy running to that thing because I want you to see Jesus as the most beautiful thing. He's not just your ticket into heaven. He's my comforter. Always oh, anybody's comforter in the room. Comforts me. Somebody write that down. Jesus is not the better of your options. He needs to be the only option. So the things that we cling to, shake them up, Lord. Our functional saviors, shake them up, Lord. Our go-tos, shake them up. Our connections, shake them up. Our, our hookups, shake them up, God. Because I want, I want to get the job not because somebody hooked me up. I want to get the job because you wanted me to have the job. You're my only option. And let me just tell you that job, once you get it, can't be your dependency. Jesus still has to be the only option and your dependency. Your bank account can't be your dependency. Jesus has your relationship can't be your dependency. Je oh, marriage, your spouse can't be your dependency. Jesus has to be the, somebody say the only option. He don't, he don't play well with other gods. Oh, he don't like it. He wants to be the only one. I got to move on. Jay Iris says, Jesus, I know you're just getting out the boat, but I got a situation. And my situation is dire. Jesus welcomes the interruption. How do I know that? Because verse number 24 says, and Jesus went with him. But here's the issue. Jesus goes with him, but so does the crowd. Because the rest of verse 24 says, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. I know Jay Iris is sitting there going, okay, hold up, hold up now. I need this emergency. This is time sensitive. I actually need you to run to my house. But all of these people are surrounding Jesus. And, and, and watch what happens as people are surrounding Jesus, slowing down the process of making sure his daughter gets healed. Mark that word. I say healed. I'm going to show you why that's important in a second. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Hold on. How old is the daughter? Okay, so, 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 so this woman had the, the, a sickness the same amount of years as the girl been alive. Okay, let me keep going. Verse 26, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and she spent all that she had and was not getting better, but rather grew worse. And she heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him. She snuck up on him and in the crowd and touched his garment. For she was made for she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out of him. Immediately, he turned around to the crowd and said, who touched me? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd that is pressing around you? Yet you say, who touched me? Verse 32, and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear. Well, why is she in fear? Because ceremonially, she is considered unclean. She wasn't only supposed to not touch people. She was supposed to be isolated from the community. Oh, she's 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 she, she, she's she's ostracized. She's she's not she's not respected. She's she's a disrespected woman. So the scripture goes on and says. But the woman, knowing that she had that, that what had happened, came to him in fear and trembling and fell down before him. And told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. Now, I know we're reading this and we're rejoicing. Like, we rejoice. Like, oh, this is a good preaching point. She touched the hem of his garment. Like, we can really shout on that. But you know what I'm thinking as I'm reading this? I'm thinking what Jay Iris is thinking. Why are you worried about her? My daughter's sick. I know y'all thinking it too. My daughter's sick. Why, why are you? Can we just compare for a second? 
Now, I want to be careful here because I, I didn't handle this well in the first service. I want to be careful. The severity of her sickness, it is severe, right? She, she's been bleeding for 12 long years. Like I, I, and, and many, you know, that's still a common issue within women. And so I understand, like, that is a major, she is, she is broken in this moment. But can you compare the severity, just for a second, of the woman that is bleeding and having an issue of blood versus the young girl that's about to die? Oh, there's a difference if, you, if we both went to the ER, the doctor's going to help the girl that's about to die. Oh, Jesus doesn't do what the doctors would have done. Because the doctor would have said, put the, put the little girl in the room. Let me get right to her. But that's not what Jesus does. He stops. Has a conversation with the disciples. Who touched me? Why? You say, that's a, I take you time. And then he looks around and says, who touched me? By the way, this is Jesus who knows everything. So he already know who touched her. This is a very rhetorical question. Oh, this is a rhetorical question. But he takes time to ask the question. And then finally, the young lady, the, the woman who had the issue of blood, she comes and says, it's me. Now, what messes me up when I read this is how persistent the Lord is to pursue people. Now, here's where your boy got convicted. Because I often... And so rigorous with my calendar, I'm just going to be honest with myself, that I no longer will pencil you in if it's an exhaustive day. Oh, but Jesus ain't like me. I, wanna, I pray for sanctification. I pray to look more like him. Jesus sees the woman and doesn't say, I'm sorry, uh, sweetheart, I, I'll get to you later, but I got to go heal this other lady, this other young girl, because her issue is more severe than yours. I mean, let's be honest. You've been, you know, you've had this issue for 12 years. What's wrong with 12 years in one day? Right? Like, what's wrong with that? Like, let's move on. But no, no, no. Jesus doesn't, he does not deal with her how I would deal. Why? Because Jesus loves people. He's always about people. He, he's always about the hurting. He's always about the broken, the, the stuff that we don't want to hear. Jesus wants to hear the, the mess that comes into our life that we don't want to be a part of. Jesus wants to be a part of it. He says, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdensome, and I will give you rest. Jesus loves people. And I just wonder, when I look around this room, how many of us, I know you'll say you love people, but how many of us genuinely love people? You have no clue how much your care and concern could be the one thing that stops someone from committing suicide. You, you have no clue how much your hug could be the one thing that stops someone uh, from, from entering into a major season of depression. You have no clue how your conversation could be the one conversation that actually sparks a, 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 some type of salvation in somebody's heart. You should care about people because your Savior cares about people. And here's the thing. Oh, here's the thing. Jair, you know what I realized? Most of us are too self-absorbed to care about people. Now, only honest people are going to agree here. We are too self-absorbed, and you know how I know? Because most of us in the room will break our schedule and welcome the interruption as long as we know that you're going to bring something to the table later. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll interrupt my schedule, or, or you, if you're notable, right? If, if, you, got, if, if you got, you know, some, some, some clout, we'll clout chase. And we'll help you because we know that later on, you're going to return the favor. And so really what we want is not to help people. We want to return on our investment. Jesus doesn't do that. He loves the unlovable. Can we just compare again for a second? If we're talking about clout, earthly, just for a second. Now, we know Jesus is the son of God. We fully God, fully man, hypostatic union coming together. We like, we know the theology. But for a second, can we just talk about Jesus' earthly ministry? Can we agree that going to the, the, to, the, to the ruler's house would have been better for his brand? Can we agree it would have given him an inroad, right? It would have given him an inroad to, to the religious leaders who didn't like him. And then, and, 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 you know, Jesus could, if he took a selfie at J. Iris' house, he'll get more followers. I know I'm talking right. Oh, if you just put me on your TikTok, I might blow up. Like, like, yeah, like, I'm going to come after Jay Iris' house. But guess what? The woman with the issue of blood, you would have thought he would have passed over her because she offers him nothing. 
Oh, she can't give him anything. But guess what? Jesus sees her as just as valuable as he sees J. Iris, the rich young ruler. There's no indifference with our God. He loves broken people. And the question you should ask somebody, ask somebody, do you love broken people? You're not asking. Ask somebody, do you love broken people? Now, now look at somebody else and just ask them, do you love them enough to be interrupted with their mess and let it be your mess? Listen, y'all. Jesus, if Jesus showed up on a reel at J. Iris' house, it, I'm telling y'all, it would have helped his earthly ministry. But Jesus ain't looking for help from clout. What Jesus is looking for is to love the broken people that are around him. I also need you to pay attention. Let, I want to remind you, you don't know her name. You don't know her name. You know J. Iris' name. That's, that's, that's the goal. And I, I know I'm preaching to somebody in this room. And, and you know, you, there's a bit of clout chasing you. You won't admit it. Right? We all got a little bit like, oh, man, like, you know, I wouldn't break my schedule for her. But if she, you know, she got that blue check. Well, everybody got blue check now, so that don't, that don't really matter. But many of us will break our schedule for people that actually have something to offer me back. But I, that's, that's been my conviction all week. Like, Lord, help me, to, help me to break my schedule and have lunch with people that I typically wouldn't have and they can't offer or bring any value or do anything for me. I just want to love them because you love them. So the Bible says that this woman, which by the way, she, y'all, I don't think we understand how much of an outcast she is. So earlier this week, because we were on the fast, you know, we, my, my, my uh, wife and I decided not to, we didn't watch, you know, we didn't watch news. We didn't watch well, for one second because, you know, the Morgan State stuff happened and my son is down in Baltimore. So we could we turn on the news, see what was going on there while we was on the phone with him. Um, but other than that, you know, we came out of the fast. and I'm like, wow, the, the speaker of the house seat is vacant. Like, I'm like, like, what? like man, the stuff is popping off. What happened in five days? But what we filled our time with was two things. We, well, three things. We filled our time with Bible reading. We filled our time with prayer in our household. And the third thing we filled our time well, for, because after six o'clock, we ate. We ate good. We had good meals this week. Um, uh, the, the fourth thing that we filled our time with was I said, you know what? The only thing I'm going to watch is Bible story. Now, some of it was mad corny, mad corny. Like, like the cinematics was whack. The story was off. But then, you know, and can I just say to those of you who are in film, like, man, we, we really, as I was searching, I was praying, going, Lord, we need... We need some real good content to tell the story. And can I go further? <laughs> and, you know, just a little bit, right? We need, we need to see some of that, right? We need to see Jesus be that. Can, I, can somebody go talk to me? Just a little bit. Like, we, we in the scriptures. Whew. They don't, even, they don't even use people from the Middle East. They use people from Europe. I'm like, bro, you French? <laughs> anyway, so the Chosen was, was you know, it was what, you know, I, I was watching the Chosen. And, you know, it, it, they, of course, they take some artistic expression. So it's not, you know, if you read the story, it's not like, uh, it's not, it's not, they, they fluff it up just a little bit. But I will say the overall theme is always the same. It's the same as scripture. It really is that. I think they really do a good job of trying to at least stay on track. And um, I was falling asleep on the couch, and the, the, Bible, uh, the Bible story was playing. Uh, the Chosen was playing, and it got to this story. And I woke up. I was like, oh, God, I'm preaching that. Give me a point or two. For, <laughs> give me a point here. And, you know, as I'm watching it, I, I, you know, I watched how the people in the crowd treated the woman. They knew her issue. They ostracized her. They would have treated her as an outcast. She was depressed in the show. She was isolated. You know, she was mistreated. And I said to myself, that is true. Because that is how you would have treated a, a, a woman that had an issue of blood. Number one, women were looked down in such a degrading way and not seen as valuable in the scriptures. Oh, let me, let me clarify that. Except Jesus and the disciples 
Oh, because you don't get it. You don't get a New Testament church without women. I just, I want to be clear here. Like, you know, I, I think we give a lot of rep to the disciples. But y'all remember when I preached about ordinary people? A lot of ordinary people were people that you wouldn't even know. Read Luke chapter 8. Read Romans chapter 16. You get to see. Read Acts chapter 19. You get to see. If y'all writing them down, write them real quick. If you read those stories, you get to see these women that were prevalent. But this woman has been ostracized. And Jesus deals with her differently than everybody else would have dealt with her. And I'm like, Jesus, man, like, man, did you, you're so dope. I want to be like you. And Jesus is like, if you want to be like me, I need you to love people that can't love you back and nobody else loves. If you want to be like Jesus, that's what you got to do. Love people that can't love you back in terms of bring value to you and love people that nobody else loves. And can I just say how he loves the woman with the issue of blood is also how he loves you. Like, cause, I, cause we also come. I think we think that the woman's just going with her issues. You go with your issues to Jesus all the time, and Jesus, his occupation has not changed. He deals with you the same way he dealt with the woman. Well, how does he deal with her? He welcomes her pain and welcomes her hurt, and it's the same thing for you. He welcomes the stuff that you think Jesus doesn't want to hear. He says, "Oh, come on, bring it on," because I want to hear it. I want to be a part of it. Don't, don't come to me after you get out of this situation. Bring the situation to me because I am loving and I care. We serve a loving God, y'all. And so Jesus sees her and he heals her despite the fact, I don't think y'all, y'all are picking this up. He still didn't get to J. Iris' house. J. What is J. Iris thinking right now? Are, are y'all, like, are y'all thinking about this? Well, I'm going to tell you what happens. While he's healing the woman with the issue of blood, verse 35 says, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Okay, wait a second. So now we're not talking healing. You missed it. You, you missed healing. That, that we're, we're past that point. Why, even, and they know it. They said, why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear only believe. On his way to J. Iris' house, he stops to help this woman. And in doing so, it was enough time that in doing so, the little girl dies. And I know J. Iris was tight. Oh, I know. When the news came, I know J. Iris was like, wait a second. Like, Jesus, like, you could have did a drive-by healing on her. You could have spit some holy spit on her. And she would have been healed. In fact, Jesus, she touched your hymn and was healed already. Why the conversation? Why, why, why do you need to talk? She was already healed. She's, my, my daughter is a young girl that has a life in front of her. She's at the tail end of her life and already has been dealing with this issue. Leave her. Come to my, come to my house. And then guess what? I bet you have enough time to come back. Now, understand something. J. Iris right now, he's never seen a resurrection. We're in Mark chapter 5, y'all. Lazarus wasn't raised to John 11. The widow at Nain wasn't raised to Luke 7. So in other words, Jairus only knows Jesus as a healer. But what Jesus wants to show is, I'm not just a healer. I am the resurrection. Oh, God. I got much more power than you actually think, Jairus. You, oh, you think I can only heal... Let the girl die. You know why you can let her die? Because the same power I got to to, to heal her, I got to raise her up. Oh, does anybody know? You might know him as a healer, but do you know him as the resurrection? And Jesus affirms this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so the Bible says that 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 the young girl dies. While Jesus is talking. And J. Iris is like, wait a second, what's going on? Well, watch Jesus. Oh, he's so powerful. Verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him. Means he's going to the house now. Except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw the commotion and the people uh, weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making this commotion and weeping? And the child, the child is not dead, but sleeping. 
and they laughed at him. That means they didn't believe, but he put them all out and took the child's father and the mother and those who were with him and went into the, where the child was, taking her by the hand, that's a touch, said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, rise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking around. Bible says, for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them not to uh, charge them that no one should know this and told them to give the little girl something to eat. He finally gets to the house. When he gets there, everybody's crying. They're in mourning. They're in bereavement. They're grieving right now. Jesus walks in and going, yo, what's going on? We're like, like, he didn't know. Like, what's, what's happening here? And they're like, oh, you know, they, 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 didn't, they, they didn't think Jesus had the power in the resurrection. And Jesus is mad. Everybody in this room get out. You know why he said that? Because he literally knew he was about to raise her. He said, that girl ain't dead. He said, she's sleeping. Now, either Jesus is lying, which he's not, or he knows what kind of power he got. Because that's the type of power he, God got the type of power. Jesus got the type of power that dead things to him look sleep. Oh, the stuff that you can't raise. Look, sleep to Jesus. And he raises her like she's taking an afternoon Sunday nap. And the girl's been dead to the point where the guys had to travel back. And he, they, you know, he raised her up. She walks around. And you know what? He cares not just to raise her, but he also cares about her health. He says, give the baby something to eat. It's my type of Jesus. Give him something to eat. Someone used that verse earlier this week. On the fast, Jesus said, give him something to eat. Let me go in the refrigerator. <laughs> the, the interruption here really highlighted the authority of Jesus. Now, here's the thing. We read this stuff, man, and, and I, 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 really think, I really think that we read it very common because, number one, we either know the end of the story or because Jesus heals so many people, we don't think it's that big of a deal. But do you know how big of a, a deal? Nobody else in the world could have done this. Nobody, nobody, there's nobody else in the world. The disciples couldn't even do it until Jesus transferred the authority. Then they was able to, to, to lay down on, on the young girl and she rise up. But Jesus at this point is the only one that can perform this type of miracle. And so he says, man, look, I can heal the woman with the issue of blood at the same time it, that not I can heal J. Iris' daughter, but I can also raise her from the dead. And here's the thing. I can do it both with one touch. Oh, I ain't got a, I ain't got a, I ain't got a revival. I ain't got speaking tongues. I, ain't got, I don't need the musicians to amp me up. I literally can be walking, someone touch my garment, and they're healed. This is power, y'all. I, I literally can walk in the room, take the little girl's hand. She get up and start walking around. Next thing you know, she's eating. That, this is the power of Jesus. And here's the question I have. If Jesus has this type of power, what are you stressed about? What, what, what are you anxious about? What, what are you, what are you afraid? Afraid of your king heals the blind. Your king makes the lame to walk. Your king turns water into wine. Your king walks on stuff that you drown in. Your king looks at a storm and tells it to behave with three words: peace, be still. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Your king has power. Somebody say power. And if he has power, why are you afraid? If he has power, what are, what are you scared of? What are you stressed? About? What is keeping you up at night? Your king just raised a little girl from the dead. Your king healed a woman and didn't even have to touch her. Now, here's the thing. I know what we're doing. We're going, man, this is a miracle, man. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. And it is, but it's not the greatest miracle. Because the proof that he can raise, see, Jesus always performed miracles for a greater purpose and a greater truth. You got to understand this. Jesus, if, if all Jesus did in his earthly ministry, if all he did was walked around and healed people, he wouldn't put a dent in the amount of sick people that were in Jerusalem. So, so there has to be a deeper purpose. So whenever he opens up eyes, it is, stop doing that. Whenever he opens up eyes, it is not because 
He fe- the person that had their eyes open, they actually died again later. This young girl was raised from the dead, died again later. She ain't alive. So Jesus has a greater purpose to why he's doing. What is the greater purpose? Why did he raise this girl? Because in 2023, he knew that there was going to be some people that were in a room and all of them were looking at this girl going, that's amazing. That's an amazing miracle. That's an amazing miracle. But can I promise you the most amazing miracle is not the girl being raised, but your heart being raised? Oh, if he got power to raise the girl from the dead... He got power to raise my, oh, you don't think your heart's dead. Ephesians chapter two says we were dead in the trespasses of our sins and following the course of, and by nature, we were children of wrath. Verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, made us alive. There it is. If he made you alive, that means you were dead before. And here's my problem. Oh God, here's my problem. My problem is that there. My fear, not problem, my fear is that there's somebody that's in this room that doesn't know Jesus. And instead of going to him, because you need resurrection, like that, that's what you need. And some of us, my fear is that you're, instead of going to him who can raise you, raise you from the spiritual death, my fear is that you're trying to clean yourself up. And you'll stand before the Lord and be like, I, you know, I spray some cologne, but, you, you, but let, me just, let me explain something to you. When you try to clean yourself up instead of going to the great resurrector, you simply are spraying cologne on a corpse. You're a, you smell good, but you're dead. You're, you're dead. And so what we need is the same power in the scripture that raised this little girl. We need that power to raise our hearts. <laughs> Salvation is the greatest miracle in the text. And both of these miracles happened because Jesus welcomed interruptions. Thank you. I got to get on this flight. Jesus welcomed interruptions. He welcomed them. And here's the thing. He welcomes yours. Now, on Wednesday, I was, not Wednesday, Friday, we sat in this room and prayed. And I, and I told y'all, man, I, I was so serious when I said it. I said, the next wave of growth at our church is going to happen through conversion. The guy's just going to save people. And I think, I think he's going to save the people that you don't think he can save. Yeah. You're, you're in the house weeping and wailing. Jesus, like, get out because I'm about to do a work here. And I think, you know, I want you to get on your mind the most seemingly sinful person you know. I think Jesus is about to save them. Do y'all know nine people gave their life to the Lord last week? Oh, wait, I messed up. Wait, don't clap. Wait, wait, wait. Nine people were spiritually raised from death last week in this room. And here's what I just want to, I wonder if the interruptions in life are the things that God is going to use to save and transform people. You don't know. Like, I know she's annoying. I know every time the phone rings, you're like, oh, I don't feel like this one. But what if that one is the one Jesus wants to interrupt you? Because you're the representation. You're the hands and the feet. He's he's in heaven. He passed the baton to you. And so the interruptions we see in the text are the interruptions that Jesus wants you to welcome. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, man. Y'all, people matter. I just don't want to, I don't want to live this Christian life that is absent of hurting people. Like, Lord, help me, help us to welcome the mess and help us as a church. Like individually, Lord, I pray that, but Lord, as a church, would you help us to welcome the mess? As we talk about revival happening and God saving people, can I, can I promise you that can get messy? But we serve a God that's not absent of the mess, but he's in it with us. And the person this week that interrupts you, I want you to take a hard look at that opportunity And see if God is trying to do something. Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, whatever you did for the least of these, you've done to me. Father, I pray for this entire room. Pray for everybody online. This is is the moment that I think you're changing our perception of engagement with people. Forgive us, God. Forgive me for being too tight with the schedule. Forgive me 
We're not adding in white spaces that allow for interruptions. Forgive us, forgive me for a clout chasing. Forgive me for trying to climb up the social ladder. Forgive me for only helping people that can actually bring value and, 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 and do something for me. Forgive God, we want to be like your son, Jesus. That was willing to help this woman that suffered for 12 years. That was willing to raise J. Iris' daughter, despite the fact that J. Iris and his companions had no love for him. Thank you, Lord, for being that type of God that cares about our issues. And may we be that type of a body, that type of people that are enamored with you. And we're so enamored with you that we want to live life in a way that reflects you. We thank you and we give you complete glory. We give you complete praise. Once the interruption happens and the testimony comes, we will not take credit for it. We will say not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name get the glory. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.